Hello Hawk Nation! Welcome junior parents and students of the class of 2022. This presentation is geared towards our current junior class and our goal is to discuss some things for you to think about as we roll closer and closer to your senior year. My name is Kim Klingen and I am one of the counselors here on campus. There are six counselors and we are split by students last names sorted by alpha. We also have a student assistance counselor, Ms. Somnath, who's who supports students' socio and emotional concerns, and we have a new representative from Collin College, uh, Ms. Fields, who is our college access counselor. Our contact information is on the last slide. Also, there's a page that goes with this presentation. It has the links that we will discuss today. It has all of our email addresses, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. In today's presentation, we will cover several items for juniors to consider and address before senior year. Again, consult the links page for the websites that we covered. We'll cover everything today from the PSAT that students took in October, uh, all the way down to starting the college search, which should be rolling for our juniors right now, college applications, which will start in uh, July of this school year, uh, NCAA, and we'll talk about military academies and the military. There is an attachment in the email, and it is also a link on the Hebron Counseling website that has the links from our presentation. This is just a sample of what that page looks like so that you'll know what you're looking for. PSAT results for students who tested are available online through your College Board account. If your student cannot access the login through the recovery links, and if you can't remember what it was, then you'll need to call the College Board directly. The counselors and the school does not have access, and, scholar and College Board won't talk to us about you and your specifics. You'll need that login for SAT registration, AP registration, sending your test score, and some other uh, things that are college related as you're going through the registration process. There's also some information in the Junior Senior Handbook on the National Merit Scholarship. Our students who are the highest performing students in the country will receive information uh, over summer and early next fall if they qualify for the National Merit Scholarship. Uh, process and if you would like some information on that then that would be listed in the junior senior handbook. Uh, the junior senior handbook is in the counseling website and it looks like this. So this is a handbook that the district has created for all of our students and it has some information for juniors and seniors to think about uh, in addition to our presentation that we have going on today. I will refer to this handbook a couple of times in our presentation and this is a really good place to go and, and look um, and have some places to get some information as you're looking for um, college information and planning. Whenever we talk about the PSAT, the College Board has information on ways that you can understand your test scores, and they have videos and practice and information on things that you can do to be able to analyze what your score and what your score means and what you can do with that information. For students who did take the PSAT in the fall, uh, it gives you free access to uh, study information that is geared specifically towards your performance and this is all free. Uh, so I would go and check out this information and it will help you to know what your scores mean. Uh, it, it also has this information. There's a link on there about how to understand what your score report means. And you can click on this and it pulls up a sample score report so that you can flip through and it'll tell you exactly what that score means. Uh, and these little charts on here do a good job of letting you know where you stand in your college readiness. If there are any changes from TEA on test requirements for STAR testing, then the district will announce these as we receive direction. 
please assume that you'll have to test for the U.S. history this spring if that comes to be. Students must successfully pass the ELA 1, ELA 2, Algebra 1, Biology, and U.S. history in order to meet graduation requirements for the state of Texas. Some students have COVID exemptions, so our juniors, if you had English 2 in the spring and you received a P on your transcript for English 2, then you are not required to take that test for graduation. Uh, please look at your star history to know where your standing is on, on taking these tests and what you have to have for graduation. Uh, the fall U.S. history students who are juniors took the test in December. In the spring, you will be testing on the week of May 4th. And students who are doing the dual credit humanities courses uh, or the humanities course where it's every other day for AP uh, concurrently enrolled with the English class, you will take the test on the week of May 4th. Uh, you will be contacted if you need to retake any exams. And again, if the TEA makes any changes, then we will let you know. It's about time to start scheduling for your senior year. Our recommendation is that you take the most challenging courses possible, but you also need to make sure that you're realistic. If you've taken pre-AP and AP classes for uh, since middle school, then by all means, please plan on continuing to take pre-AP and AP classes or potentially dual credit if that is a direction that you would like to go. If you've taken regular and gotten all A's, then maybe you should look at taking dual credit or taking an AP course in an area that you score very strong. Um, if you're finished with math, but you don't necessarily want to take calculus, consider taking statistics so that you can keep on going with those math skills. Um, for dual credit courses, those are available through Collin College. And we are about to start doing some information sessions for dual credit enrollment. So please keep an eye on your email, listen to announcements if dual credit is an option or something that you are interested in taking. Uh, Tech East and Tech West classes uh, offer an opportunity to practice in specific fields. If you're interested in maybe studying medicine, you could do the Principles of Health Science program. If you're interested in Navy production, we have that program as well. We have auto tech, engineering, architecture, and there's even horticulture. So if you know you're planning on going into college and you haven't necessarily experienced one of these areas, it's a good idea to maybe try to take one or two of those classes uh, before you graduate. Remember, colleges will see the classes that you chose for your senior year. Those are listed on your transcript beginning in August. So when we send it to colleges, they'll see what classes you took. As a senior, you are going to have an option to have senior out. Students that have required enough credits can take a senior out period. Uh, you can either do first period or fourth period. You can do one semester. You can do the whole year. You can't have first and fourth in the same semester, but you can do one or the other if you have the credits to be able to do that. Uh, reliable transportation is a requirement. Uh, you do not have the option to wait in the library or in the cafeteria or anywhere else. If you have an off period, the expectation is that you will not be on campus during that time. We do require a parent consent form and that will come out whenever we do the registration process for next school year. Early graduation is also an option for some students. Since we have accelerated block, this gives some students an opportunity to graduate mid-year. If a student has 22 credits at the end of junior year and can meet all core requirements uh, and all course requirements for their graduation plan, then you could finish up in December by the time we go on winter break. Early graduates, however, are not eligible to be valedictorian or salutatorian, and we strongly recommend that you check with the college to see if it affects your enrollment status, financial aid, and scholarships. Some schools have rules about applying for scholarships for first-time freshmen at the spring term. Some students have, or some schools have it so that it could potentially affect your classification as a freshman uh, and eligibility for freshman scholarships, so make sure you you talk with the college at time of enrollment to see how enrolling early would affect your student. 
All right, college admissions tests. There are two big ones, the SAT and the ACT. The SAT tests students' knowledges of subjects that are necessary in college, so they do reading, math, and writing. On the new SAT, the writing section is optional. Uh, the SAT also assesses critical thinking skills that you need in order to be successful in college. So each section of the SAT is scored uh, from 200 to 800, and then the two writing subscores from the multiple questions uh, and with the essay, and you register yourself at sat.collegeboard.org forward slash register. The other test is the ACT. So the ACT, um, it does general educational development and your ability to perform at college level coursework. Uh, the multiple tests cover English, math, reading, and science. So that's the biggest, biggest, biggest difference is that the SAT has that science section. There is an optional writing test, and it measures planning and writing a short essay. Now, some schools will have it so that the writing portion is required, and some have it so that the writing portion is optional. So if a student takes the test and doesn't do the writing portion, but then applies to a college that the writing portion is required, then you have to go back and retake the entire test. The ACT won't let you just sit and take the writing portion of it. So it's really important right now to do the research to see what testing is required for the schools that you're looking to apply to. Uh, and you'll register at actstudent.org. So we recommend taking the SAT or the ACT by the end of your junior year. And if a student were to ask me for advice, they'd say, do I take the SAT or do I take the ACT? How many times do I take them? Those are some pretty normal questions that I'm asked. And my answer is that I recommend that students test three times. You SAT once, you ACT once. If you get the score that you need to get into the school that you are looking to attend, then you're finished. There's no reason to continue to retake unless it's maybe for some potential financial aid. But if you need to increase your score, then most students will do better on one than on the other. And there is no factor that I can point to to say that it's because of reason X. So if you test both times and you need to retake one, then the student can figure out which one they did better on. Study, study, study on that one and then retake that test. Uh, and then usually I don't have students who test more than three times. Three is pretty much the, the number there. So the following are the test dates that are available for the rest of the school year. And so for the SAT, we've got a March date, a May date, and a June date. And for the ACT, we have a February, April, June, and July. Uh, again, I would strongly encourage you to have at least one test finished by the end of the school year and make sure that you meet those registration deadlines. The closest that you get to the registration date, the further away you may have to travel to take that test. So I would register early. Uh, fall of senior year is very, very busy. So if you wait to test until, say, October, then there's not a lot of time to retest if that needs to happen. So remember, junior year, get your testing done this school year. There are some tests for possible college credit. Uh, there are the SAT subject tests and there are also advanced placement exams. The subject tests are on specific knowledge in particular subject areas. Uh, many colleges will use those for admission and some use them for course placement. Not all schools require them. So again, I recommend that as you're doing your research this spring, you check to see if SAT subject tests are needed, required, or even desired for your school. We have had some students who've taken the tests and then the schools didn't need them for any kind of admission. Uh, also, some programs require specific tests. So if you're looking to go into an engineering program, then they may have you do one of the tests in the math areas to see if that is something that, that you're at the math levels that they need to be able to get into those programs. For advanced placement exams, uh, the test dates are May 3rd through 14th, and you could potentially receive college credit um, or 
they could use it for placement based on those exam scores. I would strongly encourage if you have taken or are planning on taking um, an AP test, look at the AP credit policy uh, for your specific school. There is a link on the links page where you can put in the name of your school and the name of your class and what the related score would be to be able to obtain college credit in that course at your college. All right, dual credit. Dual credit is for students who are ready for college level coursework. Dual credit students are independent. They're self-motivated. Parents, piece of advice, if you still have to check Skyward regularly and ask your students and follow up on zeros in the gradebook, then dual credit may not potentially be the direction to go. Um, students have to, um, they are considered adults whenever they're taking dual credit classes. They communicate with their professors, they go through the registration process, and they don't, Colin doesn't necessarily give us the grades as they're ongoing. So there are occasional surprises at the ends of terms for families. So we just want to make sure that students are prepared to be independent whenever they go on to do dual credit classes. For dual credit, there's, for college credit, there's dual credit and there's concurrent credit. So dual credit students are enrolled in both high school and college, and they are earning high school credit and college credit at the exact same time. For a student who is taking concurrent credit, you are enrolled in high school and college at the same time. However, the class that the student is taking is only going on their high school credit and not the or is only going for college credit and not for the high school credit. A good example of that would be I had a student who did um, a computer science class at Collin this last school year. The computer science class is not one that our district recognizes as a high school credit. However, she was a really strong student and planning on studying computer science in college. So she went on ahead and took that course for college credit before she graduated, but it did not show up on her Hebrew transcript. If dual credit is something that is the right class for you and your family, then it starts with us and we will do a registration and information session this spring. Uh, we will also have a window to do admission and registration. Uh, and again, families, please remember that we have to follow the FERPA laws and the student is and is considered independent when it comes to registration and making decisions for those college classes. Part of the dual credit and the college process is the TSI, the Texas Success Initiative. The TSI is a placement test. It must be taken prior to enrollment in Texas public college, university, and, and uh, technical schools. And again, this also includes dual credit classes. The test determines if a student needs to take remedial coursework prior to taking the regular coursework. Uh, for dual credit students and for first-time college students, there are exemptions. So if a student takes the ACT and gets a 23 or the SAT and gets a combined verbal and math of a 1070, then they could be exempt from taking the TSI when they go to college or when they go to take dual credit classes. Now for dual credit, we have an opportunity to offer temporary waivers and we look at PSAT and STAR scores in order to determine if a student is eligible for a temporary waiver for dual credit enrollment. Uh, so for dual credit, we look at the waivers. Uh, for our first time college students, you'll be looking at hopefully getting an exemption. It is time to start the college search. And for college access at Hebron, plan on attending our virtual college panel this spring. There will be a, uh, we'll get some colleges that come in and answer questions for families and information for dates and location will be posted later this spring. Also, you can make an appointment with our college access counselor and her email address is lkfields at Again, that will be 
posted on our links page. You can also contact the G-Force for a virtual chat or a personal Zoom meeting with a representative. The G-Force is part of um, the state's initiative for a GO Center where colleges provide uh, information for our students and families to be able to ask information about colleges and our our um, link is with UNT so right now with all of the COVID stuff that's going on uh, we have virtual chat but next year if things go back to normal though we'll be back on our campus right now it's great because you can set up a zoom meeting and your family can be there to ask questions um, about researching college and financial aid and things uh, directly from the safety of your own home. You can count the Hebron Counseling website and you can speak with your counselor as well. And we will answer any questions that you have to help start that college search. For the internet, uh, you can also uh, look at sat.org forward slash register, actstudent.org forward slash start, and both SAT and ACT have college research information. Uh, Choices 360 in the L Hub is uh, a place that we go for college and career readiness searches, and you can access that through the L Hub, and you can also visit specific college websites. So if you know you're planning on looking at Texas Tech as an option, then you can go to Texas Tech and and research some of those, research that school and the programs that they have. Uh, once you start to narrow it down, you can go on a college visit and also plan on attending the Nortex College Fair at UNT in the fall of 2021. This last year was a virtual event, so it's possible that could be a virtual event next year as well. Uh, with COVID going on again, many schools have a virtual tour option. It's a really good idea to do a virtual tour and then actually go and visit the schools you're seriously considering to make sure that it is a right fit for you. A little bit more about college visits. Students are allowed two college days for college visits during your junior year and then two days your senior year. Unused days do not carry over. Please notify the attendance office if you are going to go on a college visit. They're a really good way to get a fear of the feel of the college atmosphere and the colleges really want you to come visit. Good times to go are spring break and summer break. And in the spring, colleges will host preview days. Um, the preview days are, um, again, with COVID going on, they're limited to the number of students who they are allowed to visit. So I would research those now to find out which ones you would be interested at in attending and get signed up for them if you're planning on doing the preview days. Attendants will need a letter from the college on their letterhead stating that your student was on a campus for a visit on the date of the absence, and it must be signed by a college official. When you, if you go on a group tour for college visits, most of them have a folder that they'll give you, and it has that signed note in it to prove that, that you were there. So they know if you say, I need a note for this college visit, they either have one all ready to go for you when you show up, or they'll be able to provide one right away for you. Several schools have offices with dedicated admissions counselors in our area, and you can contact those offices directly to get information about their schools. Also, you could set up a one-on-one -on -one visit with that representative, either at a coffee shop or McDonald's or whatever, and ask them questions uh, without having to go all the way to Austin or um, Lubbock or, or Baton Rouge to be able to ask one or two questions or, or get some basic information. Okay, college admissions plans. Uh, the one main takeaway from college admissions plans is to remember that for restrictive action plans, you are agreeing that if you are accepted by the school, then you will withdraw all applications to all other schools and attend that school. 
So for the non-restrictive action, uh, action, application plans, there's regular decision, rolling admission, or early action. If you do early action on the non-restrictive, that just means you're trying to get your answer early. You can keep applying to other schools. You can keep um, trying to get your name out there. You can keep trying to get offers and, and applying. But if you do restrictive early action, then not only are you applying early, but you're saying that if they accept you, then you will not go to any other school. Um, if you're going through your application and you apply for a, one of these restrictive a application plans, the schools will ask your counselor to contact you to make sure that you understand that this is what you are agreeing to and, and that you'll follow through on that. Uh, no matter what plan you pick, you need to make sure that you meet your deadlines. It's a good idea right now to get a calendar and start getting some dates on there so that um, you make sure that you're meeting your deadlines. All right, more about the application process. The Apply Texas website, this is the Texas Common app, it's applytexas.org, and this is the application that's used to apply to any Texas public college as well as participating community and private colleges. It also has an application for scholarships from some of the participating schools. Uh, the common application is accepted by over 500 institutions in the U.S., both public and private, large and small, highly selective, and some modestly selective schools. The if you utilize the common application, then this requires teacher and counselor recommendations. So make sure that you complete your applications in time to give your recommenders time to complete their information. Uh, for Texas students, please remember that you have to complete your application even if you are in the top 10%. Um, you'll also have to submit your SAT and ACT scores even if you're in the top 10%. We'll get to a little bit more of that in a couple of slides. Uh, for most applications, they'll be available as early as July 1st, 2021, and make sure you look at the specific college websites for additional instructions. Now, with applications being available on July 1st, you could be finished with your uh, application process by the time that school starts, and then we just send your transcript after the school year starts. So it's my recommendation is apply before pie to have everything completed before you step out for Thanksgiving break, but you could have it finished well before that amount of time. Okay, the top 10% rule. Students who are in the top 10% of their graduating class are eligible for automatic admission to any public school in the state of Texas. To be eligible, you have to graduate from a public or private school in Texas, graduate on the foundation plan with distinguished level of achievement, uh, and this is the plan that we have our students, all of our students, on track to graduate with. So if you are you working on your classes, you are on track to graduate with a foundation plan with DLA. Um, you'll enroll in college with no more, within no more than two years after you graduate from high school, and you submit your application to a Texas public university before the application deadline. You have to provide your SAT and ACT scores, and you also have to take the TSI unless you're exempt from the TSI. For Senate Bill 175, this is the exception to the top 10% rule. Um, for the University of Texas, they have been allowed to limit their automatic admission to 75% of the university's enrollment capacity for first-time undergraduate students. And according to 
the announcement for UT, uh, students enrolling in the fall of 2022, that's our current juniors, this is your class, uh, students who are in the top 6% get automatic admission to the University of Texas at Austin. This is the same percentage that it's been for the last few years. Now, the one thing that I want you to remember about this top 6% and the top 10%, this is automatic admission to the university. It's not necessarily admission into your program of choice. So if you're wanting to get into the engineering school at UT or into the business school, even though you have that top 6%, uh, the business school may only be looking at students in the top 2%. So just remember whenever you are looking at schools and you are in that top 10% or top 6%, you're not just looking at the university, you're looking at the program within the university uh, so that you make a decision that's right for you and your family. All right, so when you start working on that application in July or August, uh, you need to remember that it's professional. It is a reflection of yourself. And it's important that you make everything look professional. Have someone proofread your application for spelling. If you're not sure how to spell something, please look it up. If you don't already have one, please create an appropriate email address. Um, we've, <laughs> we've seen some doozies come through. Um, when you're applying to UT, you don't necessarily want to have ski bunny at yahoo.com as your email address. You want to have something that's professional. Um, and if you need any help with this, you can speak with your counselor and we will help you to take a look at your application. We'll help you see if the email address that you have chosen would be an appropriate one. For your essays, make sure that you answer the prompt, write it, rewrite it, have someone proofread it, and you can, they'll compare it to your SAT writing sample potentially. So remember your essay is a reflection of you and it is a way to sell yourself to the college admissions committee. Uh, for recommendations, you will access the recommendation packet from the Hebron Counseling website, um, or you can email your counselor and we will email you a copy, but it is the exact same one that we have listed on the website. Uh, we've been looking at having a form, a Google form that would be filled out for a recommendation, but that has been put on hold. It may be available by the time you are ready to start looking for that counselor recommendation. Um, if it does come available, we will send that information out as soon as possible. Make sure you provide information that your counselor or teacher would not already know about you. Uh, so volunteer work, places that you work, things that you do outside the school day, hobbies. Uh, and then return the completed packet and the resume uh, and give us two school weeks before that recommendation is due. It is critical that you keep this in mind over the holidays. And if the submission comes late to us, then that means that it will potentially come late to the college. I can tell you that I was receiving recommendation requests over Christmas break with a, a January 1st deadline and I was out of town and didn't have access to my computer and we, we have to have an appropriate amount of time to be able to get this information written. Now, most of the schools have a link on where we will upload unless you use Common App. If you use Common App, then we'll upload into Common App. But if you apply to UT, if you apply to AM, then they will have a link that they will send to us that we can upload your recommendation letters for you. Some schools, however, aren't quite there yet. So if uh, if it's not Common App, it's not UT, it's not A&M, and they don't have a link, then you will be expected to provide a self-addressed stamped envelope to us to put that uh, recommendation letter in so that we can get it into the mail for you. Uh, recommendation letters are considered confidential, and we hold that to a high standard, and the schools know 
that we keep these uh, confidential so they know that the information that we're giving about you is accurate. Uh, so remember that we don't give them to you. We send them directly to the university. I can tell you that I still have mine saved back from the last 13 years. So if a student was to come back to me and say, hey, can you send my recommendation letter to school X, Y, and Z, I can go back and access that information and be able to update a letter and send it on. We keep those. For resumes, there is a link on our link page with information from CapEx on how to develop a sample academic resume. It also has a template. If you're applying for a job anytime soon, then you'll need a resume as well. So I would go on ahead and get that started now. You can always update it and change it as time goes on. A uh, resume is considered a living document. So if you get it going and then add something to it later, then that's fantastic. For transcripts, transcripts are requested online through Scrib Order, and you'll go to the Scrib Order website, put in information, and uh, the registrar sends the transcripts directly to the university. Counselors do not send transcripts. The registrar sends transcripts. Uh, many are submitted online. Most of them are submitted online. But if you are applying to a scholarship or uh, something that physically needs a transcript sent, then you'll need to uh, provide a self-addressed stamped envelope. And the registrar will contact you directly if they need something in addition to the information that you provide in your transcript request. Each student gets five free transcripts, and each additional transcript is $5. Your unofficial transcript is available in Skyward under the Portfolio tab at any time of day. So you can go online now and go under portfolio and see your most recent transcript. Now, when you are in the Scrib Order website, there is a spot for you to put your cell number. What I would do is put that your cell number in that spot because when your transcript is delivered, you will get a text so that way you know that your transcript has officially been sent. It's not a requirement to put that in there, but it sure is handy to know that you can go back and say, hey, it was sent on such and such date if the college says that they didn't have it or don't have it or didn't open it or, or whatever. So that's a, a nice peace of mind to have there. For financial aid, parents can apply for financial aid starting October 1st of senior year, and you'll use this year's tax return statement. Applications are on the FAFSA website at fafsa.ed.gov, and both the student and one parent has to have an FSA ID, and you'll apply to the, for the FSA ID at fsaid.ed.gov. The link to both of these are on the links page. I would talk directly to the College and University Financial Aid Office to discuss specific financial aid questions. Uh, also, the Go Center and our College Access Counselor can help you with the financial aid process. We will have a financial aid meeting for current seniors in the fall. We usually have it right around the time that that uh, that the FAFSA opens for our current seniors. But it's nice to have this information uh, available and to know who you can speak with about financial aid information. Once you file your FAFSA, if you're not happy with what the school, what the government says or what the school says that you'll receive, then you can talk directly with the university and they can work with you on some adjustments and, and making some uh, allowances and things. So like if, if everything was fine last year and then somebody lost a job, the college will help you to walk through what needs to be done for that to be addressed on uh, financial aid. For scholarships, the scholarships are a part-time job. It's the best way that I could think of to describe it. So we list scholarships on the counseling website. We update it throughout the year. Choices 360 has scholarship listings. The UNT Go Center, they can help you with some scholarship searches. 
our Colin Access Counselor, Ms. Fields, she can help you with searching for scholarships as well. FastWeb is a scholarship search database that's the it's been around for years and years, as well as you and I go and scholarships.com. The financial aid offices at individual schools have scholarships that you can look for. Anytime we get a scholarship, we do announcements. Uh, Ms. Rayford sends them out in our um, newsletter every month and the Louisville Ed Foundation beginning in November of your senior year has uh, the scholarships that are through uh, our district and through the through LEF. So again you have to think about scholarships as a part-time job. Yeah, the scholarship may only be worth $250, but do you write the essay and send it off and get the $250 potentially be considered for that? Or do you work for a full week at McDonald's to get $250? Um, it's, it adds up. The scholarship money adds up. All right, for the NCAA Eligibility Center, this information is for students looking and participating in college athletics, specifically in Division I or Division II. Uh, you'll need to go through the Eligibility Center process. If you're planning on playing sports in college, you should be on track to graduate under the foundation plan with an endorsement with the uh, required NCAA-approved 16 courses, and colleges prefer that you apply for or your NCAA at the end of your sophomore year. So if you haven't done that already, do it now. And you'll need to submit your transcript and your ACT scores, which is junior year. So um, you'll go on ahead and do your application now. At the end of the school year, you'll submit your transcript and your ACT scores. So that way you're ready to be recruited your senior year. And again, that's eligibilitycenter.org. If you're looking to attend a naval or excuse me, one of the academies, one of the military academies, start the process now. Uh, you'll put in a written request for an application to your state senator or your representative in April. So it's important to start finding out who that needs to be now. Uh, in the junior senior handbook, there is uh, some more information about planning, and you can also check out the serviceacademyforums.com, and they have specific information on each of the academies on places that you can ask some questions about that. Another option for students is to join the military directly after high school um, and then pursue college after that. So there's the Air Force, Army, Marines, National Guard, and Navy. In previous years, recruiters visit our campus all the time. We are always having recruiters come and available to answer questions for students. But COVID has limited this for us. Please email your counselor and we can get you the contact information for Hebron's recruiters so that you can speak with the appropriate representative. It's important to be prepared. With consistent effort, you're going to find yourself ready for college. Uh, we're here to support and get you with resources, but ultimately the responsibility of preparing for your future is yours. Uh, the worst thing to do would be to wait until this time of your senior year to start the research project, uh, researching your colleges and making that a project. Um, it's important to feel solid, feel like you're on solid ground as you're going through that process. And we're here to help with that. So you get rolling and we're here to support you with that. Again, some resources to, to, to take a look at would be the Junior Senior Handbook, the Hebron Counseling website, the Hebron College website. We'll have our, we'll have our, our conferences for next school year this spring, but we can also have individual conferences. And again, this presentation will be posted up on the Hebron Counselor page. If you have any questions, please contact your student's counselor. And again, we're alpha split by name. We have Ms. Rayford, Ms. Lovett, Ms. Hood, Dr. Fields, me, Mrs. Klingen, Ms. Renee. Uh, and then if you have any social emotional questions or concerns, then Ms. Somneth is available. And our college access counselor is Lindsay Fields. 
and her email address is directly through Collin College. We really appreciate your time today, and we hope that this is a great spring of your senior year, and we really look forward to next school year. Thank you so much for your time.